answer as many questions as possible. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why I love giving this talk is because you, when I was a university student and I was graduating and I was applying for all these companies and I was like, I was really interested in Microsoft and I was really interested in Google and Facebook and all these larger companies. But I was like, you know, only students from the Harvards, the Stanfords, the MITs, these large schools are the ones that get in there. And I would apply and I'd never hear anything. And I was just like, I don't know what happens. I don't know how this works. And so now that I work in the field and I've been on the other side, I really love to give these talks because I really want to give everyone an understanding of what actually happens on the other side of recruiting. Because right now you're at a point where you throw in a resume and it feels like you're just throwing it into a black hole. You have no idea what happens on the other end. And then magically you either get to move to the next stage or you get the, the dreaded, what we call a disposition letter, which is a rejection letter essentially. Uh, so I love to create some clarity so that as people are, are applying to these different large tech companies, they can see what is actually happening behind the scenes. Why does it take so long to hear back sometimes? What's all the complicated logistics that go into this? How are we uh, evaluating resumes and moving people through the process? Um, and so I just want to kind of create a little bit of clarity around here. Um, and then if you're actually interested in recruiting, hopefully then you can get a little information and see what the job is actually like. Uh, so then to start off, a little bit about myself. I graduated in 2018, so I'm actually not even a full three years out of college, which seems absolutely insane at this point. Uh, but I majored in business administration with a specialization in human resource management. I also graduated from the William O. Douglas Honors College, which was awesome. Uh, during my time at Central, I was involved in ASCBU or the Associated Students of Central Washington University, aka student government for three years. I started out as essentially the insurance coordinators for clubs and organizations. If you don't know, you actually have insurance policies taken out on you if you're involved in a, a club or org to make sure that you're protected during your activities with the university. Uh, so I got to handle all that. Then I ran for VP of clubs and orgs, got that role, absolutely loved it. Then I ran again my senior year for executive VP, got that. And again, loved it all the while also uh, working with the Society for Human Resource Management Club and ended up getting a position as the director of finance and getting to go to Chicago. Chicago for the SHRM conference on my final year, which was awesome. Uh, then when I graduated in 2018, I knew I wanted to go into recruiting. So I ended up actually interviewing with a bunch of agencies. I didn't know what an agency recruiter versus an internal recruiter was. I thought they were the same thing. Uh, but I ended up in agency, which was a really, really tough job. Uh, but then I, I shortly afterwards switched. So I was at CV Partners, an executive accounting and finance firm in downtown Seattle for a little while. Then I got a contract with uh, Microsoft to do university recruiting for corporate functions in Canada. And then after that, when my contract ended and there was no full-time roles available, uh, I then moved into technical recruiting for Google Cloud and Google Cloud Platform. Um, so I'll go over a, a little bit about what each one of these roles is. And then uh, really, I, I'll kind of breeze over the CV Partners one a little bit, um, just because I think agency recruiting is a little bit less applicable to what we want to talk about here. Uh, but I'll go into a lot more detail for Microsoft and Google. So uh, CV Partners was, again, accounting and finance recruiting. So I, I hired anything underneath the CFO umbrella. So that was working with CFOs themselves. Uh, but that was also, you know, senior accounting manager, senior financial analyst, uh, accounting and finance professionals. And that was across all of Seattle. So we were only housed in Seattle. And our, our parent company was actually in uh, Silicon Valley in San Francisco. So we had a couple roles over there. But for the most part, we were hiring professionals from Seattle or for Seattle from Seattle. Um, so that was most of the role. It was an agency environment, which for those of you that don't know, there's two broad categories of recruiting. There's agency recruiting and there's internal recruiting. Agency recruiting is essentially sales. It, it is, you are a third party recruiting vendor. So essentially you have a contract with a company that says, hey, I'm looking for a, a senior accountant with three years of experience. Uh, and we're like, and it would be like one of the companies that we worked for, like say Costco. Costco reached out to us and say, hey, we're looking for a senior accountant and we'd be great. Uh, we br build up a contract for them and we say, hey, in exchange for 20% of that candidate's first year salary, we'll go find you a senior accountant, submit a bunch of applicants to you. And then from there, if you hire one of them, we essentially get commission. 
Um, so agency, like I said, heavy sales environment, lots of cold calling, lots of working with contracts, stuff like that. Um, and so agency is is a really great way to, to learn recruiting because it's probably the most difficult uh, form of recruiting because you know, you're know you working with so many different companies that represent so many different products and areas and have different like needs that you have to become a little bit of a generalist and specialize in, in a little bit of everything. Um, but so yeah, agency recruiting was a great experience, learned a lot during my time there, uh, but quickly realized I was not you know, interested in doing sales. I wanted to really love the product that I was selling, which was essentially the organization that I was selling. And so that's when after, I think it was about eight months, uh, someone had reached out to me via LinkedIn, which we'll get into the importance of LinkedIn here shortly. Um, Somebody had reached out to me on LinkedIn about a university recruiting role. Uh, I thought that university recruiting was actually a step down. I had originally been working with, like I said, CFOs, and actually on my second week with CV Partners, they'd had me interview a CFO, which was incredibly intimidating, <laughs> but it was a great experience. Uh, and so I was like, oh, I'm working with all these super high level executives. Why would I want to go back to working with students? Um, but, you know, I really was interested in Microsoft, so I thought it would be a great next step for me. Uh, so I ended up taking the contract. Uh, during my time there, I was supporting hiring for corporate functions across all of Canada. So I was called what was called a full cycle geo-based recruiter. Uh, so I was hiring basically any of the corporate functions demand that we had for Canada. So that was sales, marketing, finance, HR, technical sales, and operations. Uh, and that was also internships as well as full-time, but that was also undergrad and MBA candidates. Uh, so during my time there, I, I really got to like do a lot of different things and hire for a lot of different areas. So I learned a lot about how the recruiting process works for a, a very large company that has a lot of refined processes while also being able to improve some of them and make them better. Um, so that was a really great opportunity. Plus, there was something incredibly special about getting to work with students, which is one of the reasons why I like to come back and give these talks. Uh, there's something about working with students that just provides a lot of energy. There's a lot of excitement. When you roll an offer to a student, uh, they typically will showcase that excitement. They'll lose their mind like, oh my god, I can't believe I get to work for Microsoft. Well, when you, when you roll an offer to somebody that's been in the industry for, for 10, 20 years, typically they'll be, you know, based on market value, I'd actually like a 10% increase in my stock compensation. And you're like, okay, great. I can tell you're excited. Um, so yeah, so during my time, I got to do a lot of things. I had a great time uh, and even was able to get a 98% offer acceptance rate there, which was pretty unheard of. Most of the time we, we like stay at around the 85% range. Um, so that was really fun. So that was super high level level, but what I think kind of wants to see is like, okay, how does corporate functions hiring for a company like Microsoft actually work? And so this is just kind of the general flow. Like we would call this the pipeline or the funnel. And the reason why we say it's a funnel is because it's, you know, comes out, there's a lot more candidates and a lot more activity at the top. And then as you start to go through the process, it slowly narrows down. Um, so typically when somebody's starting on the outside and they're wanting to express interest in Microsoft as a future employer template, or uh, there are a couple different ways that they can actually get into the pipeline for us. Uh, the typical one that everybody thinks of is through an application. So somebody can go onto our career site, find a role that they're interested in, then submit an application. Um, and then obviously, as you can imagine, if you know somebody at Microsoft that's either a manager or currently works there that, that has some connection to university recruiting, people can submit referrals. Uh, typically, if you get a referral submitted, you also have to apply. Uh, we also would do events and whatnot. Uh, but then there's also what's called sourcing, which for, for a recruiter, that's like 95% of what we do, which sourcing is essentially excuse me, using our internal applicant tracking system or an external sourcing or search like program to find candidates that have not applied and invite them to apply. Um, so that's utilizing primarily like LinkedIn for corporate functions or our internal system was ISIM. So we would use that. So once people get into the process, uh, typically what will happen is the kind of initial recruiter evaluation, which this is not something that, that you as you know, an applicant would see. Uh, 
Um, for us, what we do is we get a essentially a methodology for evaluating a candidate, and I can go into to details of that, as well as a profile. So a profile is essentially the minimum as well as the preferred qualifications for a candidate or for the ideal candidate for that role. So if, for example, it was like marketing, they would say, hey, ideally, we want somebody that has like previous marketing experience, we want somebody and if it was like a digital marketing, then they might say like, hey, marketing and marketing analytics, or if it's more of like, you know, a social media marketing, then they're like, hey, we want to have like data supporting, you know, social media growth or something from a previous role. So they give us this general profile and then we have this this evaluation methodology that we use which again i'll go into that we call it internally we'd call it a business acumen career trajectory and activities and leadership and then we would utilize our internal search engines in order to find candidates that fit those based on keywords um, so I think right off the top, I want to debunk a little bit of a myth. There's this idea that, you know, in the recruiting space, you send in your application and we have these robots or these programs that automatically sort all the resumes and automatically push you to the next stage or automatically reject you. Um, partially true, but mostly not. The only way for you to automatically be rejected from a role is if you answer incorrectly to one of the two questions that would automatically make you ineligible for the role. So one, if you don't have the right kind of work authorization, and two, if you don't meet the minimum requirements for the role. So from Microsoft, at the very end of your application, it'll ask you, are you now or will you ever require any kind of work authorization uh, to do this role? And if you're uh, applying for a role and you're not able to actually do that role uh, because of, of a work authorization thing or because this role can or can't sponsor, like there could be different responses depending on which role they are. For corporate functions, typically we're not able to sponsor, uh, but that's totally dependent on the visa team and the legal team and they go through all that. Uh, but so depending on what your answer to that is, as well as if you meet the minimum qualifications for the role. So if you say, no, I don't meet the minimum qualifications in the role, then you could potentially be automatically dispositioned at that point. But the rest of it, anybody else that gets past that stage, every single resume that we have are resumes that we as recruiters are going through manually. So we go through almost every single one, but we use a more efficient method of going through every single one. So typically what we'll do is we'll have like an Excel sheet. We'll use one of the keyword searches to go through and find candidates that meet the profile and create what we'd call like a short list. So just a short list of candidates that we think fit the profile that would be a good fit for the role. And then we start using that evaluation criteria to see which of these candidates are initially scoring higher on that evaluation criteria and who will actually get be able to go to the next role. Once we have that short list, we also then go in and not utilizing our keyword we'll go and see if there's anybody that we missed. So we'll go through the rest. And that means, and I'm, I'm not kidding when I say this, going through manually thousands and thousands and thousands of resumes. So that's one of the reasons why having like keywords and the right skills in your resume is so important because the system doesn't automatically go through it. We go through it. And so we need you to make it as easy as possible to find you. Once you have gone through and a recruiter has found the candidates that they think are good for the role, you'll usually go through an initial interview or sometimes people will call it a screen. And that's typically going to be three to five behavioral and situational questions that are aligned to specific competencies, uh, which I'll go into what competencies are for a role. But for those of you that don't know, a behavioral question is name a time when. So name a time when you had a disagreement with a manager. How did you go about solving it and, and fixing it. Name a time when you had an obstacle that you had to overcome. And then a situational question is also known as a hypothetical question, which is just like, if you were in this scenario, what would you do? So you'd put together a scenario and then you'd ask like, how would you actually go about solving for this. So if you pass that initial screen, that's when you would go to the final interview loop. For us, typically that would mean three to five interviews total. Each one is usually about 45 minutes long. And they're a mixture of a bunch of different types of questions that 
you'd be at. So typically, it's pretty similar to the initial screen. It's just done by the actual teams that are hiring, while the initial interview is conducted either by members of the business, but not directly hiring managers, uh, recruiters, or we even have like a specific team, we would call it our strike team, who actually all their job is just doing interviews all day, every day. They, they are awesome and have saved my butt on multiple occasions. So I really appreciate our strike team. Um, but so the final interview loop is actually conducted by the teams that actually have openings on their team, at least for corporate functions, this is the case. Case. And from there, depending on what kind of roles you're going in for, that can actually change the format of the interview itself. So for example, for sales and technical sales, as you're expected to be customer facing, one part of that interview is actually going to be a presentation. So typically what we would do is send you over a prompt uh, in order to say like, hey, like you like, and it was, I think at one point it was, you know, just present on something that you were passionate about. Like, didn't matter what it was, like just present on something you're passionate about. And we had some people in the technical sales realm that presented on their thesis on machine learning and AI and data science. Those people got a job. But then we also had people that, <laughs> I'm not even kidding, one person presented on how to throw the perfect Frisbee because uh, they were super into ultimate Frisbee and that was something they were really passionate about. And that person got a job because they're not evaluating you based on content. They would evaluate you based on your ability to storytell, to connect with an audience, to address questions. Uh, essentially, how do you pitch that this is something I'm, I'm passionate about? So potentially a presentation, but other than that, very similar behavioral and situational questions. Uh, and then if you did well on those, uh, then potentially after that, you could be selected to get an offer, in which case we on the recruiting side would get that all in input and then sent over to you. Um, so that was a lot of information regarding like the funnel and kind of the pipeline for recruiting or the process for corporate functions. Are there any questions about how all of that works and does all of that make sense? Alex, I have, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so business acumen, that seems very general. Yes. How does a recruiter evaluate that? <laughs> and this is this is where which great question. You're 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 on to the next slide. <laughs> so for us, when we're evaluating um when oh actually that's not the next one. Which one is it? There we go. General business evaluation criteria. So when we're looking at candidates that fit a profile, we then use this general methodology, which this is where recruiting becomes a little bit of a subjective field, especially when it comes to roles that are more subjective in nature. Uh, for, for technical roles and such as like coding interviews and whatnot, it's a lot easier to be like, yes, this person came up with the most effective and efficient data structure and algorithm for this particular problem. For, you know, HR roles, operations, sales, marketing, uh, it's definitely a little bit harder to evaluate that. And, and so there is a little bit of like nuance that goes into that. And so each recruiter is going to look at it a little bit differently. But generally speaking, the framework that we would use in order to do that evaluation was business acumen, career trajectory, and activities and leadership. Business acumen from an incredibly high level is just the ability to understand and navigate the inner workings of a large complex organization and be successful. And that's not necessarily word for word. This is like my summation of it. Um, but essentially somebody that would score, for example, like loan business acumen, is say that you're, you know, a barista, like that's your primary experience. So you're you're working over at Starbucks, which Starbucks itself, large organization. So like pros on the business acumen side. However, the like ability to actually navigate a complex role with that organization is not quite super high as a barista because typically your interaction is A to B. Customer gives you A, you receive, give them back their, their drink. So answer or response B. So it's an A, B relationship. It's pretty direct. It's not incredibly complex on that one. Now, the skill of actually making drinks, especially when it gets really on the complex side with like the Frappuccino and all that. I think I even saw a Minnie Mouse Frappuccino the other day, which don't even know where that goes into. Um, that's a whole different thing. I'm by no means like saying that that's not a complex skill. That is a complex skill, but it just doesn't rate high in business acumen. On the other side, if you're working for a small mom and pop shop, 
So not an incredibly large and complex organization, but you're their C your financial analyst. So you are running all of their books, or if you are an application developer or something along those lines, then that could be considered a complex role, but not within a complex organization. And so you might rank a little bit higher because the complexity of the role is higher, but the organization itself is not super high. But then say you're now, you know, a, a marketing analyst at Microsoft, that was your, your internship at some point, then, okay, that's large complex organization. And that's a complex role because you need to, in a large complex organization, it's not just what role related skills do I have? What ability do I have to do the role that I'm uh, being given, but also just in the same way that it's same thing for like universities and whatnot, but it's how does my action A affect manager B that rolls up to subdirector D that goes into product group E and then XYZ reaches the customer and how do I change things on my end to have this ripple effect that will be essentially in, over the long run more impactful? So that's business acumen. It's essentially what previous experience do you have that would be indicating that you could potentially be successful in this role because you have complex role experience, but also complex organizational experience. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, perfectly. <laughs> awesome. And then like out of all of these, like if I were to put weights on these, I would say business acumen is like 1.5 or 1.75 X in terms of its importance. It is probably the most important thing. So if you look at and you're evaluating your own resume and your own experience, your ability to go and look at it and say, where is my business acumen lie? Do I have large, complex organizational experience in a complex role? If the answer to that is yes, then the likelihood that you score high in business acumen is a lot higher and you're more likely to get through that process. But if you are a little bit on that lower side, you then have to think about like, okay, like where can I go to get more of this experience? Because that's going to be what helps get you to the next stage. Then career trajectory is more of like a qualifier than anything. It's more of just like as a recruiter looking at your resume or your LinkedIn or what applications you're, you're sending in, um, where are you ideally trying to go? Uh, are you trying to go into finance? Are you trying to go into marketing? Like help me understand where you're going. Because for us, sometimes it'll be like, okay, somebody is, is strong on the business acumen side because they were a senior financial analyst intern. And then before that, they were an audit intern with like Deloitte or KPMG or something like that. Um, but then they apply for a marketing role. And we're like, okay, this person scores high on business acumen, but the crossover for these skills is not really there as much because this is a marketing role, but they have like a finance and an audit career trajectory. So like, unless you have like a cover letter that might explain the bridge where it's, it's like, hey, I was at KPMG during my time, I was there originally as a senior financial analyst, but then during my internship, I started working with customers and then really fell in love with marketing and ended up doing these presentations. Then that might help me understand more of like, okay, that's why you're in a marketing role and that's why you're interested and that's why you're moving forward. So help us understand why this is kind of the next logical flow for you in the next logical step for for you and why you're because even high in you know software development that doesn't necessarily automatable for help career trajectory is um because if we are having trouble understanding kind of be okay. I for internship or tomorrow that person probably going to work out if it ends up being hey, a Alex, individual Alex you're breaking up a little bit versus the marketing individual role because this and then the other I got was a one Hey, um, Alex, you're breaking up a bit. Did you get 
kicked off the internet and you just came back or? Yeah, I just came back. Can you hear and see me a little bit better now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry about that. Where did I leave off or where was the last thing that you heard? Uh, it started breaking up maybe in the last two minutes. So okay. it, I mean, it was towards the end, but I didn't really hear the activities and leadership section. I don't know. Did, did yeah. you get to that or not? Okay. I didn't get to that yet. So then okay. activities and leadership is essentially bonus points. It's essentially like any extracurricular activities that showcase like a willingness to like grow, collaborate, lead, communicate, like grow in a team, like all these different things. However, again, if you have a lot of activities in leadership, but not a whole lot of business acumen and you don't have like a direction, then it's really hard for a recruiter to be like, okay, like you're, you're going to be a good fit for this role. So if you can get all of these things to kind of work in tandem, that will make you incredibly applicable for a lot of the roles that that we have. Um, so does, does all of that in terms of the general business evaluation make sense? Because we, we get our profile and we're like, okay, here's the skills needed. And then once we have that, as we're looking through all the different individuals that fit that general profile, then we start to kind of like, okay, who's stronger on the business acumen? Who's stronger activities and leadership? And then from there, filling the spots that we have for interviews. Okay, perfect. And then hopping back, because I think I, I hopped a little bit ahead, um, going into, you know, some of how an interview is conducted and like how interviewers decide what questions to use and like how the evaluations occur. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, or at least it might be simple in my mind. But essentially, every single role at Microsoft would align to four or maybe five, depending on the role, but most of the time it was four core competencies, which are essentially skills that are indicative of success in that particular role. Uh, and that's usually used broadly across different role categories. So for example, like in sales, like all sales individuals, whether they're technical sales or traditional sales or, or anything like that, they all have the same core competencies that align to that particular role. They could be some form of collaboration, some form of like customer communication, some form of like drive for results or something along those lines. But once an interviewer has those core competencies that they know that they're going to be evaluating the candidate against, then from there, there's actually a repository of questions that that interviewer can use that relate to those core competencies. So then they could ask a number of different questions that fall under the drive for results, which is where you might get, you know, different questions, even though it's relating to the same core competency. Um, so that's typically how that works. And then you as a participant in the interview, you typically want to respond with a star method, or if you want to do extra credit for Microsoft, you would call it star RS, which is situation, it says task, but I always say target, situation, target, action, result. And then the R, other RS is then reflection and solution. So situation, what was happening? Target, what did I want to have happen? Action, what did I actually do? Result, what was the outcome? And normally that's enough, but if you want to be extra good and think about like, how does this, how can I make improvements? How can I make things better? Then reflect on the situation and come up with a solution to prevent it from happening again. Um, so that's typically what you're going to want. And then also remember that interviewing itself is a skill in and of itself. Even if you're the best at your job, it's still incredibly important to practice interviewing because it, a lot of people, it doesn't come naturally. And even me as, as a recruiter that knows exactly what I'm looking for, I still have to practice these things. So I typically recommend just if you search in Google, which yes, you should be using Google, <laughs> uh, then you just search like 100 most used behavioral skills or most used behavioral questions. And you just start going down and answering those questions and practicing those, and then writing any of the consistent scenarios that you see come up over time. So yes, and use career services to help with that, definitely. Um, so that's the interview evaluation, that's core competencies, that's kind of everything that goes into that. Are there any questions about all of that? Okay, awesome. 
And then uh, more recently, I told you I, I started with Google back in January. So I'm still very new to the role. I only got my first two hires this last week. So that was very exciting. Uh, but I support now software engineering hiring for Google Cloud in the US and Canada. Um, and basically, that's all the different domains underneath uh, Google Cloud, which is a product area. So right now, I'm what's called a product area recruiter. So uh, that's basically all the pipeline that I support. Uh, and then anything underneath Google Cloud, whether they be like a general backend engineer, a front end engineer, somebody that specializes in either Android or iOS or mobile, uh, but then also like infrastructure or maybe even a platform engineer or externally they'd call them a systems engineer. Um, that's most of what I hire now. Um, and the process is a little bit different than here at Google and for a technical role than it would be for corporate functions at Microsoft for a non tech technical role. So here's a very, very similar like flow chart, but I made sure that it was actually applicable to what technical recruiting looks like at Google. So it's very much the same thing. It's all the different avenues of getting people into the pipeline that you've seen before. Uh, and then from there, instead of having this general business criteria that we're looking for, we still have profiles. But what we're looking at is like the previous roles that you had. And then, and this is also industry recruiting. So this is no longer university recruiting. So most people have work experience. So it's not just in internships and in clubs and organizations. So we're looking at previous roles. We're looking at what were you doing in the past? Uh, what kind of domain indicators do you have? So were you previously a mobile engineer? And so we can probably make a reasonable assumption. You might want to be a mobile engineer still. Um, or were you more of a general backend? Do you have any cloud indicators, such as you know microservices or anything like that, or distributed systems? Uh, and then we also look at coding languages, because coding languages, while Google is not necessarily coding language specific, Specific, you can have a, a essentially experience in a number of different coding languages and still be applicable for Google. Um, those coding languages are typically a good indicator for what role are you actually interested in and what would you actually be good at. From there, if we reach out and that person expresses interest in Google, then we do an initial exploratory conversation. This is what I typically do on a day to day. Uh, and that's actually basically talking to the candidate being like, what are you currently doing? What are you interested in? Where do you want to do it? Do you have any location preferences? Because again, we support roles all across the United States. Uh, and then from there, talk about like, what is the timeline you'd ideally like to do this in, as well as like do kind of initial preliminary evaluation of like, excuse me, like I, ideally what level do you think this individual would go in? Because we have on our end, a, a list of kind of like, here are the skills required for this level in order to be considered for that, in order to be evaluated for that. Um, and if somebody says, you know, I'm interested in this, if they fit well within that criteria, then really at the end of the day, their years of experience is way less important than the interview performance. Because again, it, it's a little bit easier with coding because it's a much less subjective field for us. Um, so if that candidate shows interest, all of our interviews are data structures and algorithms interviews with the exception of one behavioral interview that we do. And we call it our Googliness interview. Um, it focuses on things like communication, collaboration, and leadership. Uh, so if somebody expresses interest, we would then set up an initial technical interview, which is essentially uh, at Microsoft pre-COVID or even at Google pre-COVID, it'd be called a whiteboard interview. Uh, but nowadays we do it all virtually with a shared Google document where essentially the engineer that specializes in the coding language of that individual's preference. Sometimes it's Python or Java or C++, or if they're iOS, Objective-C, or something like that, they prompt them with two to three data structures and algorithms questions, and then evaluate not only like, are they able to answer and find a solution to the question, or, and also like, what was the level of efficiency in their solution for that? Because it's not just about like, how do you answer the question? It's, did you find the best solution and can you improve upon your solution? Um, if we get positive indicators from there, we move to the on-site portion, which is completely done virtually. Uh, again, it's four inter or five interviews total, four of which are technical, one of which is non-technical. Uh, again, the four technical are data structures and algorithms interview. If they have a specific area of expertise or a domain expertise, such as like a mobile, uh, then they might have a domain specific interview question. And if they're high enough level where they've done system design and architecture work, then we'll typically do a system design and architecture uh, interview as well. Uh, and then we have a behavioral interview on top of that. And then here's 
where things really, really differ from Microsoft in general and actually from a lot of companies. Um, normally at this point, the onsite would be conducted by the team that's actually interested in hiring this individual. But for Google, the idea is we want to eliminate as much bias as possible in the interview process. So what happens at this point is if that candidate shows that they have strong indicators, so they, they do well in the onsite, then we build this packet, which is just filled with all of the interview feedback for that individual. And we'd send that off to a hiring committee. That hiring committee has no connection to the candidate and there's no names, no pictures, nothing. It's literally just their interview scores. And they look at those and say, is this person approved for a Google offer? And two, are what level are they approved at for a Google offer? Only after they get those two approvals do they actually start to match with a bunch of teams that have openings and then hopefully find a place where they would actually like to, to stay and, and work. Um, so this interview process is much, much different from the corporate functions in terms of the evaluation criteria, in terms of the process itself, in terms of the structure. Um, and it's obviously, as you can tell, a little bit more intense, a little bit more cumbersome, uh, but it's also Google's known for having an incredibly high bar. So that's one of the reasons why it does take a little bit longer to get through it. Um, are there any questions along that one? I know it's it's kind of a mouthful. And so if anybody's like, yeah, like what's data structures and algorithms? What is system design and architecture? Like, I don't get this. I don't I don't know. Just let me know. Like, I'm, I'm happy to clarify. I know I went over this at a really high level. OK, awesome. So moving on, uh, applicant tracking systems, I kind of went over this a little bit. Essentially, the applicant tracking system, or ATS, which Microsoft used iSIMS, Google uses Ghire, and then CV Partners used Bullhorn, uh, it's essentially a way for us to track the progress of each candidate as well as to search them. It's also how we organize all of our jobs, because typically what will happen is once a, a new fiscal year opens up and we have headcount, which is just kind of like, hey, like what roles and opportunities are available, those roles will eventually get translated from somebody's budget into what's called a rec, which is essentially a representation of the job that they have from a financial perspective, but also from a systems perspective. So that gets input into the system and says, hey, this is a you know solution specialist role for our Mississauga office in Waterloo, Canada for, uh, or a Mississauga office for Canada uh, for Microsoft. So you're like, okay, great. So then you will open up a general application based off of that requisition. And then you would have candidates apply, you'd post that externally and then candidates would apply. For Microsoft, we actually can't move forward with you unless you've opted into our process. Some firms will actually allow you to like open up applications on behalf of a candidate. For Microsoft, we are not allowed to do that. For Google, we are allowed to do that. Um, it's really just we'd got get verbal confirmation from the candidate first. Um, but then from there, that's where we utilize this internal system to utilize those keywords that we talked about that are in like the general profile. So the minimum qualifications for the candidate as well as the preferred qualifications to start creating those lists of candidates that look like they would be applicable for the role. Uh, so that's most of what that is. So that's again, not something that's automated, something that we have to manually go through. And so us as recruiters look at hundreds and thousands of resumes over the course of a week. Uh, then if we want to make sure that we're getting you know, top candidates that had not necessarily applied, historically, when one of the larger companies or any company wanted to find candidates, whether that be in industry or in university, um, in the university space, it would be we'd have representatives that represent each different school. And then they would go out to that particular school and do like a career services day or something like that and get a bunch of app like resumes from there. And then from then move forward in the process with them. But nowadays, because we have have LinkedIn, we're able to just go and search digitally for those candidates. And that's how like somebody like myself who works in the United States is able to virtually support hiring for one of our subsidiary groups and if for Microsoft in Canada, as well as how I'm able to sit in Seattle, but then also support hiring for California, New York and a bunch of different areas. So 
we utilize, and I, I wanted to make sure you saw what LinkedIn recruiter and some of the search criteria on the site is. So I cr included that screenshot, but essentially like this is what we put together. It's, it's a form of search called a Boolean search, which is essentially an and or or function for Booleans or for, for searching criteria. And so we add in so many different criteria and we do so many different searches and we just kind of get a general idea for what the talent pool is. And then we'll send out personalized messages to candidates that we think would be a good fit to see if they have any interest in applying in our process. So like I said, that's it's a combination of, you know, locations, job tiles, keywords, schools, clubs, organizations, anything along those lines. And so this is what that typically looks like. So one of the biggest things to make sure that you are accessible for a lot of the companies that are out there looking for people is to make sure that you're building your LinkedIn, thinking about the keywords and the roles that you want so that if a recruiter is doing a search, you populate on that search. Uh, so if you're building your, your LinkedIn and you're like, hey, I'm really interested in you know accounting and finance, then I need to make sure I, I add in as many keywords as possible that fit that. But I also need to make sure that if I'm putting in like a previous internship experience, I'm using the right job title that actually fits the work that I was doing so that a recruiter looking for that is, you know, actually able to find me. Um, so that's where building out your LinkedIn is incredibly useful. And if anybody actually wants to, to take a little bit of a risk and, and send over their LinkedIn in the chat, I can actually do an ad hoc uh, evaluation of your, your LinkedIn profile quickly. Um, but we can do that a little closer to the Q&A section. Uh, Alex, I have a quick question. Sure. So, and this is something that students often ask me about is, okay, so a place like Google, mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of people that want to work there, right? Correct. So, so for a Google recruiter, maybe it's not, I don't know, how often do you actually go into LinkedIn to search for candidates because candidates probably come to you or maybe at other recruiting agencies that would be more likely? Could you, yeah. What's yeah, that's a great question. So Google, you're right, Google does get a huge amount of candidates. Um, and in fact, so many candidates that we actually split recruiting into a number of sub functions. So I'm what's called a passive channel specialist. So like you would call me a sourcing recruiter, where my job is to go and find candidates that are not active, they're passive. So that's where I go on LinkedIn and find people that are not actively applying right now and then see if they have any interest and in start getting them active in the process. And so I'm, my job is to activate candidates and to reach out to them. So I use LinkedIn a lot. I also almost, and this I promise this isn't my ego talking, but almost everybody has applied to Google at some point in their career for the most part. Uh, and so our internal system, also we do a lot of searches there and see if, you know, hey, was there somebody that, that you know, interviewed with us, you know, five years ago, two years ago, you know, 20 years ago, uh, that wasn't necessarily a good fit for the role then, but might be a good fit for the role now. So my whole job is to go find those candidates. So I use it all the time. But then we also have another branch called our active channel specialist, which essentially do don't do any individual searches or Boolean searches, they actually just look at the applications as they come in, and then just do evaluations on them based on the current roles that we have available and move them through. Um, so that's where it's, we do both, but also like as far as like university recruiting goes, uh, Google has less university roles than say like a Microsoft or an Amazon. Um, so it really just depends on like, what's the style of recruiting? What kind of roles are each one of these companies looking for? And that's where you're like, which one is more likely to yield results? Because you obviously can't apply for a role if there's no roles available, you know? Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, perfect. And there's also uh, two questions in chat. Do you want me sure. to read them to you? Yeah, 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 go for it. Okay, so the first question is, if you have a lot of career experience, what is too long of a resume? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so too long. I've legitimately gone, and actually this was, I, I volunteered during my time at CBU to do be on one of the hiring committees for, I think, the director of student life at one point. Um, too long of a resume was 35 pages. Uh, so <laughs> don't do that. I highly recommend not to do that. But honestly, the length of your resume is not as important as people think it is. Like, honestly, if you don't have a huge amount of experience, one page is what you should be doing. Um, and one page is typically applicable all the 
the way through, you know, probably I'd say, you know, five, six years of experience, I'm starting to get to the point where I might need to do a second page on my resume. But even then, resumes are, are becoming less important as long as the information is accessible somewhere. So as long as people can like look on your LinkedIn and find the experience, then you can you can curate it. But like one to probably two or three pages is typically what you want to do. The biggest thing is making sure that the information that you're putting in is matching the job description and the skills and preferred as well as the minimum qualifications for that role. So if you have you know five pages of a resume, but it doesn't match the job description, then you're never going to populate on any of the searches that we do. And the likelihood that you'll get reached out to is pretty low. But if you have one page and it perfectly matches the, the job description, then the likelihood of you getting reached out to is much higher. So it's, it's less about quantity and more about quality and efficiency and making sure that it matches. Uh, and then the, the share a bit about the T in star. Uh, T is task or target. So when something happens, you have to look at it and go, what is the intended result that I want to do? Like, what do I want out of this? So like for me, situation is like I'm going through and like I have all these jobs that need to fill. So my target is to fill the job. So I, I put together this preliminary like battle plan to go and actually fill these jobs. Then action, what did I actually do based off of that? And what kind of things happened in that? So like, did you encounter any obstacles? And then what was the end result? Was I able to fill that job or was the like conflict with a manager or something like that resolved? Um, does that answer your question, Chris? Okay, awesome. That was a great question and honestly a great two-parter. So if you have any more of those, please keep them coming. Uh, but so this is where building a LinkedIn profile is incredibly helpful and incredibly important, as well as making sure that you're populating it almost with more than you would your resume. But again, keeping in mind that career trajectory, like where do you want to go? And then curating it the way that you would curate a resume to showcase like, here's the pathway that I'm going. Here's where I want to go. Here's where my experience is. So that me as a recruiter, if I'm doing a keyword search, then you're going to populate. And it's not always a guarantee that you will because each recruiter operates a little bit differently. Like in the technical recruiting space, some people in my field prefer using the internal application system. Some people prefer LinkedIn. Some people prefer GitHub. Some people work more off of referrals. Like it really depends on the individual recruiter, how they're going to do it. So it's really more important on just making sure that you are as accessible as possible and utilizing as many avenues as possible to make sure that you show up on someone's radar. Uh, so I hope that helps on LinkedIn. And then this is a really big list of just like all the advice that I really wish that I had been given when I was graduating. Uh, and not all of this I follow. So some of this is do as I say, not as I do type thing. Uh, but so I'll go through it fairly quickly. But always start from the end and work backwards for all of your problems. That's one of the easiest ways to do it. Stay with your career. Like, where do I want to be at the end? And then work backwards. You can also use this on LinkedIn. So if you're like, hey, I want to be, for me, it's director of talent acquisition. That's my end goal. I have to look at who is currently in that role and what was their career path and how did they get there? And so part of that was going into large tech companies in order to do that. Plus, I just love the lifestyle. Um, then utilizing LinkedIn for warm reach outs. A warm reach out is somebody that actually has a common connection with you. So if you are like either went to the same university, which university is the gift that keeps on giving. So make sure that you're able to do a quick search on LinkedIn to find people in the field that you want or at the companies that you want that previously went to your university. And then you can reach out to them or previous clubs or organizations or somebody you already connected with or a previous work history or company or something like that. So utilizing that to do a warm reach out is much going to yield a much higher response rate for you than just reaching out to, to random people that you have nothing in common with that don't know you from anyone else. Um, and especially if you have somebody recommend you reach out to somebody, that's even more powerful. So I can, I can show you a little bit about how to do that in a sec. Um, so using warm reach outs to do informational interviews, 
never ask for a job, that that is a really easy way for that whole conversation to get shut down because a lot of the times those individuals either aren't hiring or may not be hiring for the same role. Instead, utilize them for advice on or information on culture, interview process, how to prepare, skills needed, potential roles that might be coming up or anything along those lines. Um, customize all of your warm reach outs. Don't create one template that is generic that doesn't include anything that's unique to that individual because otherwise you know they're not going to be as willing to share uh, utilize text expanders to make templates a little bit easier and here's what i mean by that because this is what we do for most of our work so like a text expander is essentially this it's just a chrome add-on that allows you to then use a couple key words in this case the shortcut is one cdbu to fill in this general template so if i was to reach out to somebody that i wanted to connect with about a role at central and i had them on uh, email one cdbu auto populates then copy or one sec copy paste and then hi john have you had a great day i wanted to learn more about your experience in software development yeah, 15 minutes the, and then down out, you're off to the races. So it's customized, it's simple, and it's scalable. This is most of what we do, and we do it really quickly. And we end up with, you know, 30, 40, 50 different text shortcuts that we will use to customize it even further. Um, but so that's just a text expander. They're super easy to find. Uh, so that's how you use that. And then uh, make sure your you and your work is easily searchable. That's again LinkedIn. Uh, practice divergent, so creative thinking as well as convergent thinking. So multiple solutions and one solution, uh, because typically in any given role, if you want to be a high performer, you've got to be able to come up with creative solutions, but you also need to be able to come up with a solution that fits a template if needed. Um, always keep the impact that you've had in your work experience in data form somewhere. So if you've had or percentage increases in efficiency or number of candidates you've hired or, or whatever, make sure you have that in data form somewhere because you're going to want to use this for your resumes and interviews because you want to be data driven as much as possible because that's where a lot of these companies are going. They don't want you to just say, I had impact. They want to say, how much did you have impact and can you illustrate that? Um, then general information, take a vacation every 10 to 12 weeks to avoid burnout. Uh, take one week break from caffeine or coffee every three weeks. Uh, that is how you keep it more effective. Uh, coffee has an eight hour half-life, so don't take it after 10 a.m. Otherwise, you'll still be up at 10 p.m. Um, oh, whoops. I'm going there. Prioritize sleep for high or long-term performance. Uh, become a lifelong learner. Typically, podcasts and audiobooks are the least friction way to do it. I don't know about you, but I would start reading a book get halfway through it and then in a week and then never pick it up again. Audiobooks and podcasts are the way that I go away that or over that. Uh, use dense learning forms. So articles typically take an individual like a week to make, or maybe even a month if you're lucky. Books takes years and years. So the amount of information per time spent learning is much, much higher. So your ROI is a lot higher. So books are typically the way you want to go. Thus the audio books piece. And then making sure you're taking care of your physical, mental, emotional health. Keep in touch with your professors. I have a lot of stories of my professors helping me out even after I graduate. So always, always do that. Uh, always leave the job better when you found it. Never burn a bridge when possible. Try and make a five year plan, but also be totally cool with breaking it and rebuilding it constantly. Uh, explore before you specialize. A lot of research goes into people that specialize typically make more money right out of the gate. However, over the long run, people that explore and find the role that they're actually interested in and then specialize in that role, make more money over the long run because those people that specialize, if they specialized early, but in the wrong field, they will typically either burn out or leave that field and have to restart rather than the people that took the time to find the right field and then specialize in it. And then always off negotiate an offer and always do it respectfully. Um, if you have questions on how to actually go about doing that, I can also go over that. And then here's a bunch of book recommendations that I have for you. Art of Impossible is the most recent one I read. Huge, hugely important. Uh, Moment of Lift is great as well. Outliers is another highlighted one. And then Hold Me Tight is more of just kind of like general relationship stuff that I highly recommend. So that's it. That's my spiel. That's that's what I got for you, and yeah. I'm happy. Yeah, go yeah, for it. Yeah, we have some. Oh, no, yeah, great, perfect. We have some questions in the chat box. Yeah. So um, you had offered to look at LinkedIn, 
and go in and we have a bold person in there with actually really interesting experience. I already went and looked at his LinkedIn. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to take a look at that. Uh, critique on LinkedIn. Yes, let's do it. Uh -huh. uh, hopefully this will get me in really quickly so we don't have to do that. Oh, let me just confirm this real quick as soon as it comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, oh Lord, they always make it a long one for a eight, six. Yeah, great. Yeah. Awesome. Aaron Long, great to meet you. And then, yep. Oh, already connected. Sweet. Uh, TSE, support engineer, GOC operator one, private security vendor for blah, 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 blah. Uh, Britain security travel, central Washington cybersecurity. Awesome. Yeah. No, honestly, this is well put together. You're putting in a lot of information in the right places. It's well built out. You would come up on a lot of our security specialist roles. Um, that's not necessarily the area that I typically support, um, but you're hitting a lot of the good things. What I typically as a recruiter would do is if so, I don't know Allied Universal. Uh, so I would go in here, I'd look at this and I'd go, okay, how many company followers do we have? How many people work here? And this gives me an idea for that business acumen piece. I'm like, okay, how big is this company? What's the scale that they work at? So then I can get an idea of like, okay, where do you go in there? I also know it's privately held now, which is super interesting. And they specialize in security and in investigations. So for the most part, you're hitting all the right marks. You have your, your role right up the top. That's great, great picture as well. Um, I also like, as somebody that does photography and videography in the in, on my spare time, I'd highly recommend maybe making your picture a little bit warmer. Uh, typically that includes like, if you adjust the white balance, you move it more towards the orange. The reason why you do this is because a warmer photo is typically more inviting. Right now yours has a little bit of blue tones, but I'm getting really picky. Like that's, that's not by any means that you have to do right off the bat. Um, yeah, I think the only thing that I would increase here, if at all possible, is to make sure that for the support engineer role that you have here, that you go into a little bit more detail and you start adding a little bit more of what that currently looks like, because I, I can get kind of an idea. And if I'm interested enough, what I would do is schedule an initial call with you to go over more of what does this mean for you? What kind of role is this? And go into a little bit more depth about your experience. But for the most part, my guess is it's going to be some kind of software engineer role that specializes in computer science domain or in a software engineer that specializes in cybersecurity or maybe privacy and authorization or something along those lines. Um, so no, great job. Put the education down. Great, 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 great. And then the fact that you also have your, your air or your military experience, which thank you for your service. Um, that's also great. There are a lot of companies that are trying really, really hard to make sure that we're being more inclusive with our veteran hiring. So we're going through a lot more trainings on how to read veteran resumes and understand more about how they actually do what they do. Because as a civilian, sometimes when we're looking at military terminology, it doesn't quite connect to a lot of the civilian roles that we have, even though the skills needed for each of those roles is very, very transferable. Uh, so this is all great. So no, man, like really, really great resume. Fantastic job. Thank you so much for sharing. Great job on adding the courses and the skills and everything like that. Also, uh, awesome to see that you speak Japanese. That was a fun class. If you can, which I, I always recommend against this, the only area that I would say, also for security clearance, name what kind of security clearance. Is it, is it just secret? Is it top secret? What is it? Because I've, I've done like one small stint to assist with, um, one small stint to assist with a, a security engineer role. And they were like, Finding somebody that has top secret clearance that's also in computer science that also does security is really, really hard. So if you have security clearance current, but you, if you say it's top secret security clearance or secret security clearance, then that's going to show up on one of the, the keyword searches a lot better and might make you more uh, applicable for those roles. So let's see. So that was great. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, there's also two questions um, about sharing military experience. And it sounds like maybe both participants are part-time uh, military experience and that wondering about how do you bring that up? Sounds like there could be some training, officer training or something. Um, I, maybe I shouldn't try to lump both of them. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, uh, yeah. absolutely be upfront. And, and I think one of the biggest things is like having that listed in your resume at some point uh, is also a great way to do it. Cause again, um, having that makes it a lot easier for us as people that are trying to be more inclusive and get more people with veteran status into our organizations because we're trying to get that experience in um, being more upfront about that is totally fine and even one of my colleagues uh, in the recruiting field he's also currently in the military and so he had to take leave for for some training as well um, actually so was one of my colleagues at microsoft now that i think about it so being upfront with it is is totally fine fine. Um, and I'd actually highly recommend it because I think it will actually be more of a benefit to you than it will be a harm. Because again, companies are less concerned about you taking leave. They're more interested in what skills did you develop while in those roles that would be applicable to the role that you're currently applying for. And especially when you think about like the stakes in military service versus the stakes in a civilian role, they're much, much higher. So your ability to do things like deal with pressure or, you know, be incredibly efficient with large groups of people, those skills typically come up to the forefront. So absolutely be incredibly honest. And especially if you're getting promoted to officer, that's also an indicator that, hey, this is somebody that doesn't just do their job, but they also exceed and excel at it in order to warrant that promotion. So highly recommend doing it. And it's one of those things where just like full transparency, like end of the conversation, just like, hey, I just want to be transparent with you. I want to let you know, like I'm getting promoted in nine weeks. Uh, I will probably have to do like one to two weeks of training, but really that's not going to be something that's going to be a deal breaker for them, or at least for, for most companies out there, or at least if I'm being honest, like any of the good ones anyway. <laughs> um, usually ask you if flexible with presently serving part-time and if I'd gone for a career progression. Uh, in all the years I've had, I usually ask if they're flexible presenting and if I were gone for career progression. Uh, okay, okay. Did I, did I answer that question, uh, Aaron? Because uh, it sounds like that's typically like you ask them if they're comfortable with that and then they'll let you know. Um, but yeah, always add that. I would yeah, say. that's that's correct. Sorry uh, to kind of like creep out in the back, but usually for every <laughs> every type of uh, interview that I've had, I bring it up front because I understand like for for an example, the past two years, I've been gone for about six to eight months mm -hmm. um, between like different types of training or combat zones. So I bring that up. I'm like, what happens to my position if I were gone for this amount of the extent of time? Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's that's a great point. Typically, when you're working in large organizations, if somebody's gone out, because you think like the difference between somebody going on like maternity leave or paternity leave is not going to be very different from somebody leaving for military in terms of the fact that that individual is gone. So every organization has some way of dealing with that. Typically, what I see in Microsoft and Google is you call them stretch roles. So what will happen is when somebody goes out on leave, what, for whatever reason that is, that's an opportunity for somebody else in another organization to stretch over and kind of backfill that role to either test that role out because they're interested in it. At Google, it's also called a bungee role because the idea is you stretch out and then you bungee back to your original role. Um, and a lot of times if somebody comes and, and really likes that role and that person doesn't return to that same role or wants to move roles, then the person that stretched out will keep that role and that other person will move to their new role. So because there's always moving pieces, um, it's really not something that's impossible or even difficult for a large organization to deal with if given enough notice in order to find somebody. Um, does that answer your question, Aaron? Yes, yes it does, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Also stretch rolls are just generally speaking, I, I highly recommend them because they're always a great way to get additional experience and do what's called skill stacking, which is essentially you continue to try new things. And then if you're like in the top 80% of like software engineers, but you're the top like 40% of like people that are able to like sell, then you are now in the top 95% of technical salespeople. Um, so if you're able to skill stack, it can put you into a niche that you are uniquely qualified qualified for, or just allow you to have a different perspective when you return to your original role that would make you better at that role. All right. Perfect. Yeah. And then are, are there any additional questions, like a total open book, like 
contract roles versus full-time roles? How do you manage like contracts? What does that look like? Um, what it's like being in a large company, what it's like doing recruiting for those, what the different types of recruiting looks like, which we kind of already went over. Um, or if anybody is confident enough to share their LinkedIn as well, that's also something I'm happy to, to share. Just trying to pass the interview questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, trying to apply for Amazon right now, and um, they're kind of like Google's. It's really rigorous. Yeah, yeah. Are are they? Are you doing um, a role where they're going to be doing data structures and algorithms questions, or is it general like a uh, like a TSC role or something like that? Um, for mine specifically, it's for. Um, not even data analysis. It's a new position that just opened up for them, but it's a blend of like um, software and hardware as well as cybersecurity. Oh, so you're doing integrated controlled systems and then you're marrying them up. Um, so we have to be competent in both hardware, software, and then we also have to be customer centric because mm -hmm. we're dealing with the client. So uh, situational questions are hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one thing for, for situational questions, cause like at Google, we would do something called a GCA question or a general cognitive ability question, which is essentially like an ambiguous like situation and like, how would you go about solving this? So for me, they had asked in the recruiting field, like if you were now director of talent acquisition for a startup company, how would you go about building the actual recruiting processes for this company? As somebody that wants to do that, that was a pretty fun question for me. But same thing every single time, ask clarifying questions if it's too ambiguous. Has this been done before? What resources do I have available? Like learn more about like what are the success metrics? What's the potential outcome we're looking for? In, in your case, if it's client centric, they might give you a situation where you're having to deal with a client. So it's like, what's the nature of our relationship with this client? How long have we had them? How important of a client is? What's the revenue or the profitability? for this client like ask these questions before you go in because a lot of times people will just jump right into a question because they're either excited or they're nervous and they will miss a key piece of information that would foundationally change how you go about interacting with that individual or answering that question um, so always ask clarifying questions to make sure that you have a clear understanding of exactly what's being asked of you before you present a solution Feel free to take additional time before you actually jump into your solution that you've mapped it out. Even some of my colleagues, they like to write out the structure of what they want to do, and then they'll go through it. Um, so that's that's incredibly helpful. If you're doing data structures and algorithms, the bar for Google is typically if you're doing like a hacker rank or a lead code, you should be able to get through a medium level question in 15 minutes or less with little to no additional help or hints. Uh, and that you should also be able to not only come up with one solution, which is typically like a brute force solution, but you should also be able to iterate on that in order to improve its efficiency with maybe a, a different form of a data structure or a different algorithm that would fit better. Um, so like make sure that you have all of that unlock and then practice the presentation. And then as you're also getting closer to the presentation, when you get nervous, know that nervousness and excitement are two sides of the same coin. The only difference is that nervousness shows non-confidence while as excitement shows confidence and excitement to be interacting with that individual. So excitement is typically perceived better. Uh, so that's a lot of information. Does that help you with the, the actual preparing? And then I'm also happy to go into negotiating salaries as well. Yes, uh, that was perfect. Okay, perfect. So then um, for the negotiating salaries, uh, first and foremost, always be respectful. A lot of times people get in their head that this is an us versus you type thing. Uh, typically when you're negotiating, you're gonna be negotiating with a recruiter and our whole job is to get you through the door. If we're making you an offer, we want you to come through the door. We want you to start. So always know that like we are trying to be on the same team as you and trying to get you through. We want you to join. So always come at it from a place of respect, which I have no doubt that any of you would do that. So make sure that it's coming from a place of respect. Know that there's also typically when we're looking at a compensation grid, there's typically uh, different areas that we can flex on and different areas that we can't. And there's a lot of variables that come into consideration for that. Typically, if you're dealing with RSUs, which stand for reserve stock units, which is essentially if you're getting hired from one of these large tech companies and they wanna offer stock as part of the compensation, which also Amazon is notoriously known for offering incredibly high RSUs. So 
So a large portion of your total compensation will come from the stock. Very little of it will come from the actual salary itself. And there's a reason for that. And I can go into that as well. Um, but for the RSUs, the actual vesting period, which is the amount of time that you will have to wait until you get access to that stock is almost non-negotiable every single time. It is standard per the role, per the organization. That's not something they're going to be able to flex on. Um, also, companies are typically more reserved on giving you a big signing bonus uh, because if you end up leaving, that's typically like, if you leave within 12 months, they'll usually ask for it back. Um, but typically, they don't want you to come stay for a year and then leave, in which case they've lost that bonus. So they typically want to err more on the RSUs than they do on the salary in the stock. Salary is also usually Usually pretty static. There's usually not a flexibility. So I would always argue for what you want, so like know your market rate, have data to support that rate, if at all possible, utilizing either things like a glass door, or if you want to go onto um, levels.fyi, that's also a great resource that'll kind of give you a general average for a lot of roles, typically more on the software engineering side of the house. Um, and then if you break that down to the specific geo that you're in, and then match that to the total years of experience that you have, as well as the years of experience in that particular company, you can typically get an average for what that role will pay. Um, that being said, like, well, yeah, so that's that's good information. Know that you have, make sure you have data to support a negotiation in order to support the numbers that you're asking for. You should always ask for more because you're not just asking for yourself, you're asking for your future self and for your future family that you're gonna be supporting. So always do that, even though it's incredibly hard and, and super uncomfortable. Um, and typically what will usually end up happening is that you reserve stock units are the areas with the most flexibility because they're the piece that is the longest amount of time for the company to actually pay out. So it's more on you to stay with them for a longer period of time than it is for them to necessarily pay you out immediately and then you potentially leave. Um, so I've, I've gone over like where there's typically more wiggle room and stuff like that. Uh, and I kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent, but when you're actually going about the negotiating, uh, typically what I would ask of my candidates is I have to go and typically get approval in order to actually give you the money that you want. I can't necessarily just say yes or no. And so typically what I would ask is somebody to actually write out a written kind of justification for why that individual believes that they earn or should earn more. Um, and I, like, please be as detailed as possible on what that and use as much data as possible to actually support that. Because um, I have heard people just say like, hey, like I deserve more because I have, you know, student expenses or I have a move that I need to do your extra expenses do not justify extra money from the company. Your added value justifies extra money. So what makes you different than all the other candidates that would make the company more money that justifies the, the extra income that you're, you're, or the extra income for you? Um, so make sure you're using the added value to bring in and try to make sure that you're focusing on things that may not have been considered through the interview process up until that point. So for example, especially with like military experience, which is incredibly valuable, if you can go and make a case for, hey, you know, I have this many years of experience in this particular like cybersecurity field or software engineering field or, you know, customer focusing field, like, but I also have this military experience where I learned all of these different things that the average individual in this role would not have that will make me more effective in this role. And that's one of the reasons why I should do it. And that's like, and then again, showcase as much data where it's like, we grew our unit from this many people to this many people, which improved our actual operational efficiency at this much or anything along those lines, if you can. Uh, does that answer your question and help you with that? Okay, awesome. And then, Brooke, you're you're off of mute. Do you have a question? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Well, um, are, are, oh, go for it. Oh, sorry about that. I was just gonna say to tack on um, with that. I actually had to do one of those justifications for RSU and um, for military every year they usually do like a, what's called like a performance report. You could actually use that as justification if you need to. Um, I've also used like certifications just to amplify or at least like showcase like, hey, I'm using my own time and money to be able to like focus more on the job and be able to uh, bring in more with 
the company. Yeah, no, and that's that's honestly that's a great strategy. Again, like the biggest thing is more of like just make sure you're not using information that's not impactful in that justification in order to try and like get more money. Because again, I, I had one candidate that even said like, "Hey, I'm planning on going back to you know I think it was China to to marry my wife, and it's going to be an expensive wedding." And they were like, "Can I get more money for that?" And I was like no like i'm sorry like that's that's not a valid justification i i can't go to one of my managers and say hey can we give them more money for their wedding um as much as you know i i would love to uh that's just not unfortunately how that works because again it's it's not added value so previous performance reviews certifications that are outside of the normal again uh, the key being outside of the normal, if that is a if a certification is a part of the required qualifications of that particular role, then it's probably not going to do you a whole lot of good to use that as a negotiating tactic because everybody that interviewed for that role probably has that certification because it was a requirement for the role. If you have additional certifications on top of that that make your experience more valuable and more unique, then absolutely be sure to use those. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, again, I want to make sure that I leave any any questions out there if anybody has them, but if not, like this has been fantastic. I love the questions. I love all the information. Like it's been a really fun time. Thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom. I mean, I wrote notes today <laughs> and I learned a couple things and uh, there's a couple things that I had not heard of. It was really interesting about the Microsoft, the, the added RS at the end. And I'm definitely gonna share that for services. And uh, yeah, we just appreciate you so much, Alex, that you come back and yeah. give back to the university and share your knowledge. and. Um, yeah, I maybe again next year, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Always happy to do it. I appreciate all of you tolerating my, my long winded rambling on all this information. So hopefully this information will be useful for you as you go forward. And it, it was Aaron, you're, you're the one that had, or no, it's Chris, you have your AWS panel on Thursday, dude. Good luck. Like, I, I'm so excited for you. That's going to be awesome. AWS is, and especially Amazon is absolutely a, a very fast moving, like crazy organization. But if there's a place where you can like grow quickly, it's going to be there. So I, I wish you the best of luck, man, on that. It'll be great for you. Great. Well, thank you, Alex. And, and good night to everyone. If you have any follow up questions, just send them to me. Thank you. Good night. All right. Bye. <laughs>